There are times in the Pali Canon where Venerable Ananda seems to be playing the straight man. He'll make an ill-considered comment, and the Buddha will have to correct him. That's when he stated that dependent and co-arising seemed very simple. And the Buddha said, no, it's very complex. It's because it's so complex that beings are still entangled in suffering. When he says that admirable friendship is half of the holy life, and the Buddha says, no, it's the whole of the holy life. Not that admirable friendship will do everything for you, but if you have an admirable friend like the Buddha, that's when you know that it is possible to follow the path, and that it's a good path. Without the Buddha, where would we be? There's another time when a Brahmin drove past in a chariot, all white with white horses. The chariot itself was white, the wheels were white, the upholstery was white, the parasol was white. And Ananda said, Why, well, what a sublime vehicle. And the Buddha said, If you want a real sublime vehicle, look at the Noble Eightfold Path. And then he gave a very extended simile, comparing the parts of a chariot to aspects of the practice, not just the factors of the path, but other factors that go along with the path. Of course, nowadays we're not familiar with the parts of a chariot, but some of the parts correspond to parts of an automobile. And sometimes it's good to think about these similes, to see what you can learn about how the Buddha regarded the different qualities of the path. The horses, he said, were conviction and discernment. That, of course, could be the engine of the car. This is what drives us, our conviction that we don't want to stay stuck in suffering. And there is a path out, and we're capable of doing it. In other words, we have conviction in the Dharma, and we have conviction in ourselves. If we don't have conviction in ourselves, our engine is sputtering. Like the car I had when I was a teenager. You'd step on a gas so it would just stop for a bit to consider things before it took off. It didn't take off very fast. So you want to make sure your conviction and your discernment are fine tuned. And it's interesting that the Buddha would put these two together. You don't want your conviction to be gullible. You want to think carefully about what's worthy of respect, what's worthy of listening to, and what's worthy of following, and what's not. The Buddha wouldn't have you have conviction in just anything. The idea that all paths lead to the same goal has never been true in the world outside, and it's certainly not true in, inside either. So you have to be very discerning in how you choose a path, choose the way you want to be practicing, realizing that this is the engine that powers you. Discernment is part of that engine. The axles, the Buddhist are jhana. They may turn around, but they've got a still center. You want to have that quality to your concentration so that you can carry it out into the world. If you're sitting around talking all the time, you have to ask yourself, well, where's my concentration right now? You've lost your axle. To try to reestablish it. We establish it as we sit here with the eyes closed, but then we try to keep that sense of the still center as we go moving around through the world. As we've discussed this afternoon, the center doesn't have to be one particular spot, but there has to be an area inside your body. where you feel, okay, this is my stillness. To switch analogies, I knew a botanist one time who said that there's a part of every plant that has to be still. And from that part, when the plant is damaged, the repair work happens. And if that part gets damaged itself, then the plant's going to die. In the same way, this still center inside 
is what helps repair a lot of the damage of the world that it does to us and that we do to ourselves. So we really do have to work on this sense of stillness. Because around the axle, turn the wheels, and the wheels are right effort. Notice back in those days, the wheels didn't provide the power, it was the, it was the horses. But the fact that the wheels were able to turn around allowed the chariot to move and didn't have to be dragged. So in the same way, your effort should make, be an effort to make things easy. You make things easy for yourself by not giving in to unskillful qualities. Every time you give in to something unskillful, you have to remind yourself you're making things hard. Because you're simply reinforcing old ruts in the mind, old bad habits in the mind. And the more you give in, give in, give in to your defilements, the harder it makes to follow the path. So you really do have to make that effort. It may seem it's making it hard for yourself now. Well, it's hard for yourself now, but it's going to be easier down the line when you make this effort. I know so many Dharma teachers who say, well, nirvana is the ultimate ease, the ultimate rest, so the path should be a restful path. But after all, you, you can't do something stressful to get to rest. But that's like saying, you know, smoke comes from fire, therefore fire should be black too. Causes are not necessarily the same as their results. And John Sawat made the comparison one time. He says, when you're eating, there's an effort that goes into eating. You have to chew your food, you have to select which foods to eat, which foods not to eat. And your body has to do the work of digestion. The sense of fullness that comes from that is something else. The sense that your body feels well balanced, well nourished. It's not the same thing as all the work that goes into getting it nourished. So remember that the effort may seem hard, but it's actually making things easier, just like Having wheels on the chariot makes it a lot easier for the chariot to move. And back in those days, chariots were also vehicles of war. So the Buddha said the chariot has, has weapons and it has a shield. And it's really interesting, the weapons, non-ill will, harmlessness, and seclusion. We don't think of ourselves as bristling with weapons when we're following the right result. But that's what the Buddha is talking about there. The seclusion there would be seclusion from unskillful qualities, seclusion from sensuality. So it's basically realizing the causes of suffering come from within. They come from our own unskillful behavior. So a better part of wisdom is to say, okay, I'm not going to have ill will for anyone. Because if I have ill will, I'm going to start acting in unskillful ways. I'm going to be harmless. I'm going to try to overcome my fascination with sensuality. And it's interesting, those are weapons. That's how you defend yourself against the world. Because the world is going to do a lot of things that would make it very easy for you to feel ill will, to want to do harm, to want to play out your sensual fantasies. So this is your protection, having right resolve that no matter what the world does, you're going to maintain your skillful resolves. And then the shield for the chariot is endurance. Whatever the world throws at you, you learn how to take it. You don't constantly let your feelings be hurt. You have to keep reminding yourself, if something's being thrown at me, I threw it at somebody in the past. It helps to deal with the, the sense of righteousness that comes when you feel like well, you've been wronged. Well, you've been wrong in the past, too. And to 
end any of the back and forth that goes on in the world. Endurance is going to be really useful. People can do other things, you just put up with it. You, they do it and you put up with it. And that really is your protection. So you've got an armored car here, powered by conviction and discernment. And the driver is mindfulness, and the Buddha said it's a protective driver. You drive in such a way that you keep the vehicle safe. Mindfulness, of course, is the ability to keep things in mind. And what we keep in mind is the Buddha and the Dharma and the Sangha, the fact that there was a Buddha. He found this path, and the path is still alive. It's still an open option. It's so easy to forget that as you get involved in the affairs of the world. But you've got to remember, okay? what's really important in life is the fact that we have this opportunity to practice. Then we remember the Dharma. What does the Dharma have to say about what's skillful and what's not skillful? Those teachings are never out of date. For all the Buddha says, they're akaliko, they're timeless. And they remember the Sangha. Sometimes the Buddha seems far away. 2,600 years ago, on the other side of the world. But we do have the Noble Sangha, still alive, still practicing, still able to bear witness that, yes, the Buddha's teachings, when you put them into practice, really do give results. So try to keep these things in mind, because you can have a great chariot, you can have a great armored car. But if you don't have a mindful driver, either the car just sits there, or the driver can be dangerous. So be a good driver. Your sublime vehicle is ready and waiting, because you have these potentials for all these qualities already within you. There is a potential for conviction, there is a potential for discernment. Right resolve, patience and endurance, jhana and effort, mindfulness. These are all qualities that human beings have. It's simply a question of whether you're going to develop these qualities or you're going to develop something unskillful. The Buddha offers training in skillfulness. All too often we train ourselves in unskillfulness. We don't think of it as a training, but as we give in to our un unskillful habits or unskillful tendencies. That's how we train ourselves. So be convinced that you do have the potential within you, and try to make the most of it. <laughs>